appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with you today about an ongoing project of which really is a team effort. Uh, you've met members of the team that have been working together. Uh, let me also point out some folks like Jessica Davis, who's sitting back in the back, who's also part of this uh, research team that we have. And Nicole, is Nicole in the room too? She's here at the conference. Nicole Emberton's right there too as well. And then Carolyn Davidson, who was a graduate student who worked on this project. Uh, what I'll present today in terms of empirical results, I want to be, I want to be careful and say that it's dated in the sense that it comes from old information. It's a survey that took place in 2008 in our case. And the science in terms of, of when we think about and how we think about ammonia emissions and also the business model uh, for feedlot production has changed from that, that time period. So what this does for us is, is provide us with some interesting insights and lessons into how we might go forward and repeat some of the things that we've done. Uh, I also think we'll take away some things that'll help us in terms of, as extension professionals, in targeting some of our assistants and give us some things to think about. So that's the direction that we're headed as we talk about uh, this particular study. Uh, our overall goal was, was to help industry, uh, and you've met some of the folks today talking about industry, Bill Hamrick said some of that too, and also our extension personnel and really targeting how they might assist. And that assistance might be in terms of technical assistance, um, providing some information or some training that takes place or demonstration, but also uh, things we might do in terms of cost share assistance or being able to provide services that might reduce the cost of some of the best practices in which we're interested. So that was our overall goal. And in particular, what we wanted to be able to do was, was to benchmark best practices that are currently being used at the feedlot level. Uh, some of those best practices really aren't about uh, reducing emissions of ammonia into the air, but they're actually best practices, as Shauna mentioned, to improve uh, uh, your cost of feed per pound of gain, for instance, or maybe to, to prevent some water quality problems that you might have. So not exclusively for those, but best practices in general. Uh, we also want to determine what the best means are for eliciting best practice and demographic information. One of the things I'll talk about with the survey was is we had a poor response rate from our producers that were providing that. And we learned a lot about how to ask questions and the types of questions to ask as we went through that process. So that was something that, that we took away from, that, uh, from our study and we'll use in the future. And finally, I want to pick up on some primary influencers of adoption of those best uh, practices. We know that um, from a producer standpoint, profitability can be very important, but your perception of profitability or how hard something is can also influence your decision. The size and the scope of your operation, where you're located at, and the regulatory environment that's around you can also influence uh, adoption. So what we'd like to be able to do is tease out the things that are most important. And if we can change those or relax those, just how much bang will we get for our buck by investing in that area? And so those are some of the things that I'd like to, to talk about and, and have us discuss as we go forward. So let me talk a little bit about this four-state survey uh, that we did in 2008. This was a questionnaire that was a mail survey mailed out to feedlots and also some dairy folks too, but I'm going to focus on the feedlot side of things today, uh, to four different states, uh, Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, and Iowa. It's really interesting the demographics of feedlots are very different between those states in terms of the overall size and who manages those operations. So there's kind of a nice heterogeneity associated with those, those types of operations. Uh, we followed a pretty standard Dillman technique where we mail out the survey. Uh, we weren't tracking responses. The National Ag Statistics Service was tracking those responses for us. We didn't really know who had sent surveys back, but we went with a postcard reminder and then a second follow-up survey. So the same sorts of things that you saw before. We had about 160 feedlot responses. I would characterize these by size. About 46% of our respondents were less than 1,000 head, and that would be a snapshot at a point in time. How many do they have in the lot today? About 47% of our respondents had greater, or uh, sorry, between 1,000 head and 30,000 head in terms of the number of animals they had that day. And then the last 6% of our respondents had more than 30,000 head. We had one respondent who was a very large feedlot. Um, uh, as part of what we had. I say a low response rate. We had about a 13% response rate to our survey mailing, which is small enough that I don't think I can take policy conclusions from what I'm presenting today. But there's some information there that's pretty informative. So let's, let's take away what we can from what we get. The types of information we asked, um, one of the reasons why we had a low response rate, John, was this was a very large survey. And we asked a lot of questions. Uh, and so, so one, some of the questions we asked about had to do with best practices that people were using. Do you use this today? Uh, and what are your perceptions of this pra practice? Is it costly for you to do it? Does it require uh, technical assistance that's outside the operation? Uh, is it profitable for me to do this? Were, were some of the perception questions we asked. And then we asked some questions about the demographics of the operation. So you might expect size to be one of those in terms of animal units. But also we asked about the footprint of the operation. Uh, we asked about the facilities that, that folks had had. 
Uh, we asked some questions about the age and the education and the experience that our respondents had um, to try and get a good feel for what was, con what was influencing the, the types of responses that they had. I'd say another, another reason why we have this low response rate is, is this is a, of a politically sensitive nature, isn't it? Uh, and so, so I think that revealing that information is really difficult if you don't know who James Pritchett is at Colorado State University. Uh, and, you're, and you're mailing some, something back. And I think to the extent that we can address those issues that are politically sensitive and do that in a way that we obtain the information we want but ensure the confidence of our respondents, that, that becomes pretty important too. So you have an idea about what this survey was like. These are the best practices that we, serve, that we examined. Uh, we looked at this uh, potential opportunity for reducing ammonia emissions, emissions in a variety of different ways. Part of that had to do with the feed side of things, so we examined what that was. Uh, we looked at how folks handled their dry lot and how they suppressed dust, uh, what the density of their, of their uh, production was. And then we took a look specifically at some manure BMPs too. So these were the 13 um, that we were particularly interested in, asked folks to check a box, yes or no, I do this on my operation. And then what were your perceptions of those? Some of the results that we found were, were that a lot of folks used feed additives, sort of what, what Sean was talking about today, but a different set of feed additives that we had back in 2008. Uh, measuring crude protein, two things that are done by a lot of the operations across the different sizes of operations. Uh, when it came to using an acidifier or to using some sort of water um, dust suppressant, less folks did that. Now, I point out the top of that table and the bottom of the table for a couple important reasons. If we're trying to explain adoption, why people adopt, and everybody's already doing it, uh, really, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to tease out without that variability in terms of what folks are doing, what really influences their decisions. Uh, and so that's both on the high end, where we might not get much bang for the buck because everybody's doing it already, and on the low end, where not many people are doing it. Just not enough variation for me to be able to determine what's going on. So really, the middle parts of these, in a statistical sense, are the ones that it's easy for me to explain what's going on and what might be influencing decisions. So these are the, the adoptions that we had. We think a variety of things influence those, like where you're located, your regulatory environment, and what your perceptions are of how, of how these things will affect your operation. And that's what this next chart shows. So we asked folks using a one to five Likert scale if they thought that using this practice was, for instance, um, profitable. Does it, does it improve the profitability of my operation? We also asked, does it require technical assistance from outside the operation? I need to hire somebody else to be able to do this. And then is it costly for me to implement this? Maybe the cost is prohibitive and, and it's some, a hurdle we can get around. And from an extension standpoint, maybe that's something that we can ask for some cost assistance for. Or perhaps on this profitability question, maybe it's something that we can do some research about and communicate whether or not that's profitable for the operation to adopt that practice using things like Sean had just, had just presented for us. So Likert scale, one to five, the one thing I point out is, is that bigger is better in terms of the perception for the first two columns. For the last column, smaller is better. Because if I, if I strongly agree with the statement that it's costly, I'm going to give it a five, right? So it's a reverse scale on, on that one. Uh, when it comes to the different practices that are there, that are there most folks felt that applying water on that, uh, within that feedlot that that wasn't a profitable circumstance. Everything else uh, rises above neutral in terms of the outcomes except for the applying the acidifier. So both of those dry lot dust suppress and sorts of activities. Does it require technical assistance? The sorts of things that you might expect. Um, do I hire a nutritionist to do things? Um, do I measure the crude protein within my ration? Do I adjust those, those rations? Um, those um, most folks felt like required some outside technical assistance. And if you're hiring outside individuals to come in and provide you with advice, it's likely that tends to favor larger operations than smaller operations. Larger operations making a repeated decision probably get more bang for the buck. If, it's a, if there's a slight improvement associated with it, you can spread that over more head. Same thing with costs. If it's a fixed cost, you can spread it over more animal units. So it tends to favor those. And we'll see that when we predict the adoption that takes place a little bit later. So now you have an idea of what their perceptions were about the best practices. A lot of different things influence those, um, those perceptions, but also that influences your willingness to adopt. So now let me talk some about the willingness to adopt and the role that some of those, some of those played. These are from the results of the study. So we'll invest a little bit of time in explaining this particular graphic. This is that one to five Likert scale in the first table that we had where people explained or chose 
whether they strongly agreed, agreed with a statement that said this is profitable for my operation. Using the results that we had statistically from the yes, no, and trying to predict the probability of individual respondents saying that, and then holding everything else constant, we can adjust the profit profitability and then determine the likelihood of somebody adopting that particular best management practice. And so I've got four best management practices that were significant uh, when it came to that, that perception of profitability and wanting to, to adopt the, uh, I'm sorry, when the perception of profitability was significant in explaining the adoption that took place. So using bedding within the operation, taking a soil test, testing the ration, and then incorporating manure within 48 hours after it had been applied were the four different practices that were involved. So when you look at, let's take this soil test as an example. Uh, if I think it's profitable for my operation, then I score that as, as a three or higher. As you might expect, the more profitable it, that it is, the more likely I am to adopt that particular practice. But there isn't really much of a change in the adoption level when it, with related to the change in my perception of profitability. So perhaps investing a lot in explaining the benefits to my operation in terms of profits really aren't going to, really isn't going to encourage folks to do that soil testing perhaps because they already know that, that's really well documented, or perhaps because I'm going to do that anyway. So we wouldn't expect as much bang for the buck that's taken place. With different types of practices, though, it's true that if we change the perception of profitability, then we start to get more and more adoption taking place. And with some practices, we'll actually get more adoption um, by just changing the perception a little bit relative to what those other ones are. There's a marginal difference, a change that's very incremental in what that is. So measuring across, increasing from a perception of profitability where we don't think it's profitable from two to a neutral stance that, that is three, might increase the adoption for some practices, like incorporating bedding or testing that ration, than it does for other types of practices. So from an extension standpoint, what this does for me is, is tell me where I might target um, some of the education that I have if I want to achieve some, some goals that are, that are out there. The one thing I'll say is, is that these practices, we haven't really talked about the benefits of the practices in terms of reducing emissions or the cost of implementing those practices. Instead, it's really about folks' perceptions. So we may target based on some benefit-cost relationships um, that aren't related to, to what we've shown on this table. But it does give us some ideas of where we might get the biggest bang for the buck. The other thing that I think that came out of our survey responses are is that demographics of the operation, the size, in particular the size, but also the footprint that you have, uh, what your age and education was, would influence the level of adoption. And the trend that we see in the feedlot industry is, is for really a, a bifurcation of types of feedlot operations. Very large operations are tending to increase in the number of animal units that they have. Very small operations are tending to increase in the number of, of animal units they have. It's the middle that's getting squeezed out. And we're not seeing as many of those operations start, sort of trending away from what that is. If the trend is toward larger operations, and we measure the size of the feedlot on this vertical scale and the probability of adoption on this horizontal scale, then as operations are getting larger, we're going to see increasing amounts of adoption of these types of practices, we believe. And so if the industry is trending that way, then I'm not sure that we have to mandate those types of activities because the problem may take care of itself. And so that's one thing that we need to take into account as we benchmark these types of, of results and we examine the trends that take place through time. Uh, it may also be the case, though, that with putting shade over, over that dry lot, as an example, that as operations get larger, get larger, we'll see less and less of that practice being adopted. So taking into account those industry trends, taking into account what perceptions are in terms of cost and profitability and technical assistance may help us target what, what takes place. Let me, let me give you just a little bit more treatment on how we might use this uh, as, uh, as extension professionals and as educators thinking about the practices that we have. I've got um, the different practices, like hiring and nutrition, are measured in these column bars. And the predicted adoption uh, for each of those practices is measured by these really cool plaid scales that my daughter helped me with uh, when, when we were trying to pick it pick the really scientific one. So the red crosshatch is about a 90 to 99% adoptability is what is what our, our statistical exercise predicts. 75% to 89% is what that blue is. 
the X is less than 50%. If it's blank, it means that this wasn't statistically significant, so I didn't feel like I could say anything about what that adoption level was. And then what we did was, was break this out by type. So type of operation in terms of what the size is of the operation for a small, a large, and a very large. And then how did they rate things uh, in terms of those practices? So folks that really felt like hiring a nutritionist was highly profitable for their operation may have different opinions than those folks who didn't feel like it was as profitable. So we have high profit and low profit as our different types of clusters of operations. And then low cost was another statistically significant one that stood out. And then whether or not I felt like this really required a lot of technical assistance or didn't require very much technical assistance. So when it comes to something like soil testing, which is this middle, middle area, we really anticipate that folks who see this as highly profitable for the average size operation, folks that are, believe this takes high technical assistance or low technical assistance, but their sizes were average to small, would tend to have a high opportunity for adopting this practice as it went forward. And so I think that's really interesting because regardless if you felt like it took a lot of technical assistance or not, um, there was still the opportunity to be able to encourage more adoption when it came to the soil testing side of things. So in some sense, I think we can, if we repeat this work, be able to tar target particular clusters of individuals or particular clusters of operations by characteristics and really target our extension programming to those folks to get the best bang for the buck or to reduce the barriers the most so that we get increased adoption. Again, it really takes us to understand a little bit about what are those costs and benefits of our selected um, best practices so that we are getting the best bang for the buck. And that's, that's one of the steps that I think we need to do uh, in the context of this study from an economic side. Uh, one thing I'd like to do too is, is to work with folks like Jay and Sean and update the best practices that we think make the most sense. Uh, we had an initial literature review that gave us the 13 that we used. I think we've learned more about that now and so tightly focusing on the ones that we think are the most promising is something useful for us to do. Our next step then will be to benchmark current best practice use. And I, what I'd like to do is, is to follow this trend over time. I'd show the slide of how operations, if they change in size, adoption may change in size too. So we can validate that as well, but it'll help guide where, where some of our work will go. Uh, and then we'll repeat that survey again uh, for the purposes of targeting education and assistance, doing it both for dairies and for feedlots, uh, probably focused more tightly in Colorado in this case, rather than working in the four-state context. So I think that's, Jay, that's what I have in terms of, of talking about this study. It was a big study and there was a lot done with it. I just want to focus on a few results and, and generate some conversation. Um, so what questions or, or comments do you have? Yes. Are you sure the very best can't be found? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't think that we had the right instrument to be able to, to answer that question. It was really a yes, no. And we talked some about this because operations are different, right? I've got the <clears throat> I've got the the lot down by the river and I've got the one on the sand hills. And maybe I do two different things in those two different operations. We didn't ask folks to fully describe the operation or how it might be different. And that's that would be the kind of question that it would be really useful. I, I, since this time, so everything we did was mail survey in 2008. Um, since that time, we've been experimenting with online surveys, and they have we have on our online surveys now slider bars that tell us what proportion of, of a particular question that you might do. And I think we would be able to use that slider bar um, to efficiently ask those kinds of questions and have folks respond. So do we do this on all of our operation, on 50% of our operation? I, I think that might be a way to address that. Man. Yeah. 
Yeah, so maybe maybe what we need to do is is to calibrate. Maybe we don't do that in an entire survey, but calibrate that with sort of focused investigations of operations. Investigation is a bad word to use. Working with partners uh, and talking about, and then maybe we can extrapolate that to a survey population to be able to do it. I worry about the pushback we get from asking too many questions first because it's too long, because time is really a precious resource, but also too detailed of questions because folks, they're really concerned about how this might be used against them rather than what benefit I might get out of it. Yeah. Thank you.